One more round of applause for, for Cliff putting this thing on and everybody else. And thanks for having me. And thanks, holy crap, it's Saturday. And you guys are nerding out. So that's awesome. So <laughs> early Saturday and you're nerding out. So, so thanks for being here and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of some, some trends in web design uh, a little bit, but really sort of come back to this notion of uh, the page, right? The page has been with us for a couple thousand years, uh, actually, you know, sort of, uh, you know, parchment pages and, and paperback pages and now sort of pixels. And it really, this page metaphor has been with us since the early days of the web, right? Since the genesis of the web, right? We talk about, you know, how many pages our website is, or Brad, how long is a home page gonna take to build, right? I'm sure we're all used to stuff like that, right? And I have to design this page, or I have to build this page. Well, this is our reality now, right? <laughs> the web is a little bit more than the sort of desktop days of, of the past, right? We now have all these smartphones, dumb phones, netbooks, notebooks, e-readers, right? game consoles, all these other things that, that we have to send our UIs to, right? So now with the rise of responsive design and all of that, it, it's not feasible anymore to basically have to crank out multiple versions of a page in order to sort of demonstrate a, a concept. Does anybody, just out of curiosity, does anybody work in places that sort of creates like three different versions of a comp in order to sort of, yeah, it's all right, this is a safe place, it's, it's fine, it's cool. Uh, so this, I mean, this technically works, I guess, but, but also it's, it's really nothing more than a tremendous waste of a talented designer's time, right? To have to re-articulate all of these things and say like, oh, here's what our home page looks like on a tablet. Here's what our home page will look like on an iPhone or whatever. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't really serve the design. So that's what we're gonna talk about is blowing up sort of this notion of thinking about our, our web experiences as pages. And also quite literally like blowing up our interfaces and really getting into, you know, what are the web's Lego bricks, right? What are the web's sort of uh, subway sandwich pieces that we combine together to form sort of millions of different delicious combinations, right? So the basic gist of what a lot of, you know, sort of trends over the last couple of years have, have involved is breaking things down into these systems of component, components. Anybody uh, sort of a foundation by Zurb or play around with, with foundation before? Okay, yeah. What about Bootstrap? Where are my Bootstrap people at? Yeah, there's the hands, right? So I'm not judging you. It's, it's fine. It's cool. <laughs> no, good. These these things are, are are fantastic, right? Like in theory, it's like that's that's what we're talking about, right? A UI sort of kit, a set of components that we could use and assemble in whichever way uh, we want. And I, so I think that these are great you know, from a conceptual standpoint. But this is this is my problem with them. Uh, whenever I'd watch sci-fi movies as a kid, I'm like, why are they all dressed the same? <laughs> and it's like some guy just came in and was like, you know what? From here on out, we're, we're wearing jumpsuits. And people are like, well, okay. <laughs> it's like it just sort of accepted that or whatever. So, so, and then you end up you know, with a, a lot of people dressing the same. Of, of course, that's not how human beings operate, right? We all have different set of style. We all have different goals. We all have different aspirations. So you can't just come in with sort of a one-size-fits-all solution and, and expect it to work. And so that's sort of my problem uh, a little bit with, with these frameworks, is that they are a solution. And whenever half the internet is using that solution, uh, and you know, they give you sort of button styles and drop-down styles and all this stuff, which is great. Uh, but whenever everybody's using that, they all start looking substantially similar, right? If you're Nike, Adidas, uh, Puma, Reebok, if they were to all redesign their sites using Bootstrap, they would start looking substantially similar, right? That's sort of not what they're going for, right? Um, and it, at some point, there's, a, there's this sort of, you know, you can, of course, modify and extend and sort of, you know, tweak it, but at some point in time, the effort to sort of extending or, or tweaking the, the framework becomes more of a hindrance than, than just sort of rolling your own. 
Uh, these frameworks are great. They provide you a lot of stuff. Oftentimes, you don't end up using all of that stuff, but your end users have to download uh, your carousel script and things like that, even though that you're not making use of it. Uh, on the flip side of that coin, they might not go far enough, and you end up having to write a bunch of custom code anyways. Um, this is a big one. You have to subscribe to how someone else has structured and styled and named things. Um, me personally, I don't really want to write class equals jumbotron. Uh, that sort of feels weird to me, uh, and that's fine. Um, so, but again, conceptually, these things are fantastic. So, uh, Dave Rupert, a good friend of mine uh, that works at a. a Austin-based uh, web shop. They did uh, the redesign of Microsoft.com. And what they delivered to Microsoft as their sort of deliverable, he's, he sort of hit on this notion of that we should be delivering and sort of building like sort of tiny bootstraps, right, for every client. So he said, responsive deliverables should look a lot like fully functioning Twitter bootstrap style systems that are custom tailored for your client's needs, right? So that last part is the operative part there. Right? It's not just about using a design system or, or a UI toolkit like Bootstrap. It's about taking the time to craft your own uh, uh, design system that's going to solve your organization or your client's needs. So that's what's sort of given rise to what we call front-end uh, style guides or pattern libraries or component libraries, a bunch of different names for them. But these things are, are awesome, right? Uh, they promote consistency and cohesion, right? So rather than sort of, you know, stepping through an interface and by the end, by the time you get to the checkout flow, you've already sort of encountered four or five unique uh, UIs that you have to relearn again and again. By having a consistent experience, right, wherever, whenever somebody uh, uh, encounters form fields, for instance, they know how those things operate after the second or third time uh, they sort of interact with them, right? So that leads to more, you know, more conversions, more cohesiveness, and, and happier users. Makes things easier easier to test, testing responsiveness, testing accessibility, testing performance. Uh, we're able to sort of home in on, on any given component and sort of see how those things uh, operate. It establishes a better workflow, more collaborative workflow between designers and developers. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Creates a shared vocabulary so that everyone understands what utility bar means or something like that, right? Whereas, you know, in the days past, right, someone would call that, oh, that's the admin bar. Oh, we call that the top bar. And then the class name on it is utility bar. And so you have these, you know, wildly different names for the same thing. So these pattern libraries sort of help normalize a lot of that stuff. They become a useful reference to keep coming back to as you build more features, as you build, uh, uh, you know, extend the system. And lastly, it serves as the sort of future-friendly foundation, right? By setting these things up, by, by establishing your custom design system and pattern library, you could build on this thing for years to come. It's sort of like a one-time project that even if you were to burn everything down a couple years from now, like three or five years from now, you're like, oh, this, this you know, aesthetic looks terrible. Well, guess what? You're still going to have buttons. You're still going to have inputs. You're still going to have cards, or you're still going to have you know these components. So you don't have to sort of, you know, burn it all down and build it from from the ground up every three to five years. So these things are awesome. Uh, they're out in the wild. Uh, Code for Americas is a great uh, pattern library. Mailchimp's now on their sort of third or fourth iteration of their uh, pattern library. Yelp's is particularly good. Uh, it all really started, though, with uh, Starbucks. Uh, so Starbucks went responsive about like three and a half, four years ago now. And whenever they released uh, their, their new responsive site alongside it, they release their pattern library, right? They're basically like, here's the sort of patterns that make up this new responsive site. So if you crack this thing open, you see things like this, right? Blocks three up, right? Here's this pattern they're going to be using a bunch of different places throughout Starbucks.com, right? And you're able to squish the browser and sort of resize it and sort of see how it all reacts across different view parts. Um, here's, you know, tables. Here's a sort of a, a simple table with three columns, and you could sort of squish that onto smaller screens, no problem. But then what about this really complex table? How is that going to transform itself, uh, uh, you know, onto smaller screens? Uh, if you want to come to my workshop uh, later on, we're going to talk all about sort of different patterns for sort of dealing with this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about sort of taking the time to craft 
the solutions that will make sense for your organization, right? So I love these. Like, I think that absolutely this is how we need to be approaching design and development projects in, in this day and age. Problem is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> These things take time to create, right? I don't know about you. Or, or do you ever go into work and you're like, oh, I wonder what I'm going to do today. <laughs> right? Maybe I'll make a pattern library. It's like you know, we're all under the gun to get things out the door right, all the time. So, so it's very, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to sort of carve out the time. It's a useful tool, but at the same time, how do you actually capture, uh, sort of make that happen? sort of feeding into that, it's often treated as this auxiliary project, right? It's a nice to have that if the going gets tough, it's like, ah, yeah, we, you know, I know that we said we are going to do this whole pattern library thing, but we got to get this new feature out the door, so therefore, uh, sorry, it's got to go. Very often these things are too abstract, right? Blocks three up. Well, where does that actually get used? How does that, you know, how does that look in context? Very often they're only seen as a designer tool or developer tool. Uh, so like only one, maybe the front end development team uh, sort of treats it as, as sort of theirs and, and their sole owners of this thing and that other disciplines aren't invited to the party. Sometimes they're created after project launches. It's like, ah, let's just get this thing out the door and then we could sort of go through and sort of cherry pick things after the fact. And then lastly, and this is the thing that I really latched onto was, was that I felt like a lot of these pattern libraries that were being released into the wild, which is fantastic, um, lacked sort of a clear methodology. It just was like, here's a big spray of components in no particular order. So that's sort of what I set out to do uh, is sort of think of a, a sort of a more thoughtful way to, to construct our, our interfaces. And, and so that's what I call atomic design. So that's what I'll get into next. So in the natural world, right, we have atoms, right? Hydrogen atom, oxygen atom. These are the basic building blocks of all matter, right? Uh, they have their own properties. They're also sort of an abstract concept, right? You don't see them floating around by, by themselves in, in nature, right? But those atoms combine together to form molecules, right? Like a water molecule is two at hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom. And now suddenly that takes on its own properties, right? It's a, it, it becomes sort of a useful uh, sort of component. Those uh, molecules keep combining uh, to form more complex molecules, which keep combining further, further to form organisms, which keep combining together to form more complex organisms, like a person. Um, I did a Google search for uh, people, and this guy came up. I was like, yep, <laughs> nailed it, um, going in my slides. Um, but so all matter in the known universe, kept him in there, um, all matter in the known universe can be broken down into this sort of finite set of atomic elements, right? This is a beautiful, beautiful concept, right? And as it turns out, we have this on the web, too. So uh, this is a guy named Josh Duck, who now I, I believe works at Facebook. But he put together the periodic table of HTML elements, which I thought was really cool. So it's like, here's all of our sort of table markup on the right. Here's sort of our text markup in, in the yellow. Here's uh, you know, sort of our form uh, elements in green. Like, this is cool, right? So uh, I, I really love this sort of display. Um, but so because we're sort of dealing with a similar thing, maybe we could use that sort of same process that happens in the natural world and apply that to how we construct our user interfaces. So that's what atomic design is. So atomic design is this sort of um, collection of five stages that all happen concurrently. Uh, so I'll just sort of point this out. It's like not a linear process. This is just like this sort of coexists at the same time. So atomic design is atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages all working together to not just create our final user interfaces, but also create the system, the patterns that will make up that final interface. So I'll just sort of give you an example of, of sort of how this, this goes down. So atoms, right? So in the natural world, again, hydrogen, oxygen, they all sort of have their own unique properties of the basic building blocks of matter. Um, in our user interfaces, we have things like, here's a label atom, right? Here's an input atom. Here's a button atom. These things can't be broken down any further without ceasing to be functional. But they're also abstract, right? You're not going to find just a, bo a button floating around in space uh, in, in your sort of final site. 
So that's where molecules come in, right? So we take those atoms at the molecule stage. What we're doing is we're combining those things together, right? So now suddenly that label atom is defining that input atom. Now suddenly clicking that button will submit that form. So now we have this nice little encapsulated piece of functionality, right? This nice little sort of simple component that we could drop in wherever we need to include search functionality. So at the organism level, what we're doing is we're taking that sort of search form molecule and we're putting that into context of a bigger component, right? like a header organism. And that header organism might be comprised of a logo atom, a primary navigation molecule, a search form molecule. But all these things sort of operate together as a group, right? as a distinct section of a UI. And we see this on literally every website we go to. right? We see headers, we see footers, we see these relatively complex components that are all sort of you know, serving a purpose and sort of operate as a, as a unit together. Um, and it could be a bunch of disparate elements like images, lists, and forms, and whatever operating as a group. Or it could be like a product grid organism on a sort of you know, e-commerce site where it's the same sort of product card uh, you know, component repeated over and over and over again. Right? But you could include this anywhere you need uh, sort of a product grid such as you know, obviously a category page or a search results page or related products or something like that, right? This reusable, relatively complex component. So people get tripped up over this a lot. People <laughs> email me a lot and they're like, what's the difference between sort of a molecule and an organism? How should I classify these things? First of all, I say, like, don't, don't think too hard about it. Like, don't have like an hour and a half long meeting of going, well, I think this is a molecule and I think that this is a, an organism. Don't, don't think too hard about it. But uh, just little participation using Facebook as an example, what would you call this, right? So if, if molecules are simple components and organisms are complex components, what would you call this? Yeah, complex, right. So this is an organism. Whenever you break this thing down, you could break that into sort of smaller components, right? So that's, that's like a, a, a good sort of exercise. Is like whenever I blow this thing up, am I left with a handful of HTML tags or am I left with a couple uh, smaller components, right? What about this guy? Simple? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say so. You're left, if you blow this thing up, you're left with an image tag, a title, a link, and, a, and sort of a, a passage of text, or maybe a paragraph or something. What about this guy? Simple? I'm hearing simple whispers. But then you get sort of weird stuff like this, thanks to their new components. So, so again, so you know, some things are, you know, can go either way or whatever, but, but this sort of as a unit would probably be complex, right? Because you could break this thing down into this like, uh, you know, emotion bar <laughs> and then like an action bar or whatever. But the, so those things independently might be molecules, but then sort of collectively they form, right, this, this sort of organism. So, okay. So that's molecules and organisms. Now, at the template level, what we're doing is we're taking these relatively complex components and now putting them in the, the context of a page layout. Right? So this is big. Um, but it's really at this stage that we're focusing on the underlying sort of content scaffolding or a skeleton of a page rather than sort of the, the final, the final uh, you know, content itself, which is what we're going to get to in the page stage. So we sort of put these things together in, as templates, right, where we sort of put everything uh, in their general uh, sort of position on the page. And then at the page level, what we're doing is we're taking this template and then we're pouring real representative content into that template. Right? So this is obviously an important step just because this is what your end users are going to be interacting with. This is what your boss and, and clients are going to be signing off on. This is what your colleagues are going to be sort of deliberating over. Um, but it's also at this stage that we're really sort of testing the validity of the underlying patterns, right? What happens whenever you pour in right, this particular hero image into you know, your, your component? Right? 
into your hero component? What if you have this picture of mountains versus this other picture of, of people? What if it's a, a darker image or a lighter image, right? Does the pattern fall apart? How are we going to address that? What happens if this headline is 45 characters long? What happens if it's 450 characters long, right? These are all sort of you know, especially, well, you all know if you're working with, with Joomla or any sort of CMS, right? The dynamic nature of content, right, very much influences the, the, the UI and how that stuff is presented. And that needs to be accounted for in our design systems, right? So our design systems need to be able to be resilient enough to handle whatever content we're pouring into them. Um, it's also at this page stage that we're able to sort of test variations of a template. So for instance, you might have, um, you know, a, a home page, but then you also have a home page that says, like, warning, like, our <laughs> Yahoo, maybe Yahoo's home page or something. Warning, <laughs> your, change your password, please. <laughs> Don't ask why, just, um, you know, just change your password. Um, or if you have a web app or something, uh, you know, the user logs in, uh, they hit the dashboard page, and maybe that dashboard has a bunch of things like your recent activity and your friends and, you know, how many steps you've taken today and stuff like that. Well, that's all great if you're sort of a, a user that's been here a couple times and has been using the service for a while. But what about that new user, right? What about that person that's logging into the system for the first time? What about that user that's logging in that has admin privileges versus not, right? So maybe you know someone with admin privileges might see a bunch of extra controls or navigation items or you know sort of edit and delete buttons versus. Uh, uh, sort of a regular user which won't see those, right? We need, it's still the same underlying template, but just based on whatever sort of the, the situation is, it's good, it might in some cases radically transform the UI. So again, so our, our design systems need to be able to handle that stuff. It, at Atomic Design sort of gives a framework for sort of how to articulate those things. So I've been working this way for the last three and a half years-ish. Um, and I think that the biggest thing that, that I like and, you know, about working this way is that it gives me the opportunity to sort of traverse between abstract and concrete, right? I'm able to sort of simultaneously see, you know, that, you know, my final UI, but I'm also able to sort of see that stuff exploded out into its smallest components. And then I'm able to step through how those small atoms combine together to ultimately arrive at that final interface. Uh, I've also learned that, that clients <laughs> don't, don't really give a shit about the, the uh, atoms and molecules. They're sort of like, uh, how, how much will this cost? And <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but that's fine. And I still find it really valuable, actually, to expose them to this concept just because it helps educate them that, yeah, we're not just creating you a pretty new home page. There's a lot of thought going into you know, making reusable components and, and building for reuse. Um, and atoms at the other end, like I mentioned earlier, they're not terribly useful on their own, but it's helpful to sort of sometimes see what those sort of base styles for each component is. And the real sort of building process sort of happens at that sort of simple component, complex component, and sort of template level. It's also worth pointing out that, uh, you know, this is a concept born of the web, uh, you know, we're mostly web people here, I would assume. But really, this is a methodology for any UI. So your bank's kiosks, Microsoft Word, uh, you know, any sort of software, anything with a UI, can, you, you can apply this methodology to. So this is uh, an example of what Instagram might look like, right? Sort of blown apart into essentially a handful of like icon buttons, uh, some text elements and uh, a couple sort of image types, but then we're able to sort of step through and sort of construct these relatively simple components, uh, and then sort of a more complex component that really serves as the meat and potatoes for the entire Instagram UI, right? It's that sort of photo organism that's stacked on top of each other 100 times, right, in an infinite, screen, uh, infinite feed. So that's, that's sort of the, the basic gist of it, right? So you have these sort of relatively simple components that make that up. But then it's that, that sort of organism that's, that's repeated over and over again. It's also worth pointing out that I've sort of landed on you know, certain names for things. And I can't tell you how many emails and people that corner me and they're like, why don't you just call them elements, modules, and components? And then person two uh, is like, why don't you call them 
space components and modules, right? And I'm like, exactly, right? So a lot of these terms, you know, this is nothing new. Like none of these concepts are, are tremendously new, right? Modular design and development has been around for ages. Um, but these terms that we use mean different things to different people, right? Whereas sort of atoms, molecules, organisms implies a sense of hierarchy. But that being said, this isn't gospel. <laughs> this isn't like rigid dogma or anything like that. Uh, the team at, um, at uh, GE, at General Electric, uh, they sort of started off with the atomic design sort of taxonomy. And then it found that a, a lot of people were tripping up over the sort of the language. And they had already had some sort of things in place that they thought might be more useful for them. So they ended up sort of you know, extending it a little bit and modifying the names. Uh, to better serve the organization. So great, so do that. <laughs> so, you know, do what's useful for you and your team, right? So, but I say all that just because a lot of people, I think, like to put words in my mouth and are like, oh, Brad says to do it exactly like this. No, choose, choose the, the, you know, the, the names and the process and stuff that, that makes sense for your team. Make sense? Okay, cool. So it, that's the sort of mental model. Atomic design is the sort of you know, mental process of, of sort of thinking about our UI systems. In order to actually make this stuff happen, I created a tool along with uh, uh, Brian uh, uh, Munzenmeyer, which I'm still getting my head around his pronunciation, uh, and uh, Dave Olson. They run the sort of Node and PHP versions of this tool called Pattern Lab, uh, which is an open source uh, design sort of uh, design system builder, right? It's a way to actually construct these atomic design systems. So what Pattern Lab is, is this a static site generator sits on your, uh, sits on your computer and either sort of PHP or Node will sort of stitch together all these atoms, molecules, organisms, and so on. Uh, it's a design system builder, right? It, the, the, with the goal of making these sort of atomic design systems. With the end product being your comprehensive component library. Every little sort of pattern that makes up your final UI will be sort of captured in Pattern Lab. It's also a pattern documentation tool. But what it isn't, or I'm sorry, and then a design toolkit. It has some other features we'll talk about. Uh, what Pattern Lab isn't, though, is it's not a UI framework. It's not like a competitor to Bootstrap or uh, a Foundation. In fact, you could actually use Bootstrap or Foundation inside of Pattern Lab. Pattern Lab is just there to sort of help stitch everything together. Uh, it's language, library, style, or workflow uh, uh, independent, which means that if you want to use SAS, cool, go for it. If you want to use React, cool, go for it. If you want to use this, that, or the other, uh, Pattern Lab sort of is basically just like a blank canvas. So anything you put inside of Pattern Lab is owned by you. And, and so, yeah, so we're not like enforcing like a jQuery dependency or anything like that. You could do, you could construct your front end markup however you want. Uh, it's not incredibly rigid. Uh, it's not just a pattern library. It's also not sort of like a CMS site generator. It's not like a, a Jekyll or something like that. It's certainly not a competitor to like Joomla or something. In fact, so like basically how a lot of this stuff ends up working is that we sort of design and build things in Pattern Lab, get our sort of production ready sort of front end code in place, and then sort of that gets imported into a CMS like Joomla or WordPress or Drupal or whatever. So, so that's sort of the workflow. It's not meant to serve up uh, sort of final sites. However, some people like the University of Chicago and Harvard Business Review and stuff actually have sort of hacked it and extended it that they actually use Pattern Lab to serve up uh, their, their uh, UIs. So that's a lot of words. Here's what it looks like. Looks like shit. That's intentional. Um, again, sort of really getting uh, what we're trying to do is really underscore the purpose that that you have to do all the design and development work yourself. Uh, Pattern Lab's just sort of there to sort of help you along the way. But what it does provide is it helps, uh, it provides some sort of navigation so that you could traverse between all of your uh, atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages, right? So at the atom level, we have sort of things like, you know, uh, colors and font families, but then here's what our headers look like and paragraphs and inline text elements, just sort of like listing out you know, all of our sort of base styles. But then at the molecule level, right, this is where we start constructing widgets like this, 
right? Or this one. Uh, this is uh, for a project we did for Time Inc. Um, this is a pretty basic component, right? Nice little thumbnail image, headline, and some excerpt text. Um, and the way that we're actually constructing this is using a templating language called Mustache uh, Pattern Lab 2, which just came out recently, now supports things like underscore, uh, twig, and other sort of templating engines, which is cool. But so in order to make this thing, uh, we make something like this. So this is a little snippet of HTML that we're basically saying, okay, we're calling this a block post, right? Which, whatever, naming things is hard. Uh, and all of the stuff in orange is mustache code, right? So I'm basically giving it a dynamic URL for this link, a dynamic headline, a dynamic excerpt. But the real sort of power comes in this little greater than sign. So we're telling Pattern Lab to include an atom called thumb which is that nice little 400 by 300 image there, right? So whenever uh, Pattern Lab compiles and builds, it's going to go out, search for that uh, atom called thumb, and sort of pull that in. So now I have this nice little encapsulated piece of code that I could use that same greater than include pattern to include wherever I need to include that block. So at the organism level, what we're doing in order to create, say, a header, we're actually sort of creating a header tag, and we're including the logo, we're including the primary navigation, we're including the search form. All right? So now anywhere we need to include that header, we're using, again, that same greater than include pattern to, to sort of include that. So you can sort of see where this is going. It's, it's like Russian nesting dolls. right? The little things are included in the bigger things, which are included in the little bigger things. right? Uh, and what that does, what that allows is to, for us to keep things nice and dry. right? I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the concept if you're more like a programmer, this notion of dry means don't repeat yourself, right? So what we're doing is we're sort of establishing these, these sort of patterns of varying degrees of complexity. And if we need to change, let's say, an avatar image, we could do that at the atom level. And any pattern that's including that atom will automatically update, right? So this beats the pants off of like, working in Photoshop across like 50 different files, and then the client comes back and they're like, you know what, I don't like those buttons. Change those buttons, and then you have to comb through 50 PSDs, and uh, yeah, it's not good, right? So, okay. So then at the template level, what we're doing in order to create, say, the homepage template, I'll just sort of give you a perusal, you could sort of see a few patterns repeated a couple different times, right? So again, at the template level, what we're doing is we're just sort of laying out the content skeleton and showing like, here's what we're expecting from, you know, from a CMS standpoint or whatever. We want these images to be this, or we want to put character limits on our headlines or something like that. So what that looks like, we're including a header, we're including a hero, and we're sort of wrapping it in a name. We're just giving it a name. And I'll sort of touch on why that's important now. So, Again, at the page level, what we're doing is we're taking that sort of content scaffolding and pouring in uh, real representative content. So we're taking this template and pouring in pictures of Beyonce. Um, and it's the, this is my pro tip to you. If you ever need fast track design approval, pictures of Beyonce. It's just like, as soon as a client saw this, they're like, yeah, this is great. Like, let's ship it, right? So it doesn't matter if you work for a bank or like financial institution or government, like just pictures of Beyonce. And they'll be like, this is great. So, so okay, so you could see what we've done is we replaced that sort of, you know, grayscale images, those FPO images, uh, that sort of lorem ipsum text with real representative content. So now you could see what that template looks like with different content poured into it. Again, this is what the end user is going to see and interact with, but we have to make sure that the patterns we're putting on the page are capable of handling all the different types of content that we're pouring into it. And the way we're doing that is with um, a little bit of JSON. So we sort of define our FPO stuff and Laura Mipsum stuff as sort of as like sort of base JSON, where you know, it's called like data.json. You could be like headline, Laura Mipsum. But then at the page level, we're basically saying, I want the title to now be Time Inc. rather than page title or something. And rather than saying, I want my hero image to be, you know, FPO hero, I want it to now be hero underscore Beyonce dot JPEG, right? So that, that will sort of swap out that stuff. 
Uh, what's cool about this is that this actually serves as a nice little sort of blueprint for the CMS, the, the sort of integration team. So I've worked with a, a lot of different teams where like sort of our job ends in sort of building the production ready markup, but then we have to work with the team that's integrating uh, this design into a CMS, and it helps these people, you know, the, the sort of CMS implementers to go, oh, okay, I'm going to need this field, I'm going to need this stuff, this stuff is static, this stuff is dynamic. Really, really helpful. It's also, again, at this stage that we're testing variations and sort of stress testing the components, right? So we might have that sort of the left, it's like there's the template level of this thing, and then at the right, we're sort of pouring in longer names to make sure that, you know, that this pattern is capable of handling those different patterns. Uh, it also includes some other stuff. We get garbage like this in our code and stuff, oh, 320, iPhone 4 in portrait view, uh, 480 in iPhone 4 in, like, in landscape view, 768 in iPad in portrait view, right? 1024 and iPad in landscape mode, right? The fold, right? Oh God, the fold, right? <laughs> um, but of course, you know, in order to create uh, these design systems that are meant to go anywhere, we have to consider the entire resolution spectrum. So built into Pattern Lab is a viewport resizer tool, so you're able to sort of squish and scale the entire design or individual pattern to make sure that it's resilient and it sort of holds up uh, across the entire resolution pattern. Uh, there's also uh, built in a disco mode, which sort of kicks the, the viewport around like crazy, and the clients love it. They're like, oh, look at it go, look at it go. Um, and it's great um, because I think it really sort of more or less serves as an education tool, right, for, for clients and colleagues to understand that, yes, the, the, the web is this sort of continuum of, of resolutions, and that we can't just go, here's the iPhone view, here's the iPad view, here's the desktop view. Like, that's a very myopic way of, of viewing the, the, the web. So, okay. Um, it also includes annotations. I'll just sort of touch on this real quick. Rather than sort of baking in um, annotations into some crazy long 200-page PDF, uh, what we're doing instead is actually sort of building this into the UI itself. Uh, so you can uh, add some uh, uh, annotations to your UI, which is cool. Um, gets all that great sort of IA and you know sort of wireframe thinking into the browser. Um, lineage. Uh, this is a really tremendously helpful uh, uh, feature that Pattern Lab provides, where basically we're, you're able to sort of provide context for any given pattern. So what this means is that we can look at any pattern. This is uh, for a project I'm working on right now. Um, we have this sort of media block pattern, and it's like that's great, but where is media block? You know, where is this pattern sort of employed? What's, what's it made of? And so Pattern Lab will tell you that because of the sort of Rus Russian nesting doll sort of approach to this, we can sort of print out that sort of breadcrumb trail in, in essence. So it basically says the media block pattern contains the following patterns. Atom square, which is that little square thumbnail image, and this uh, button bar sort of component, which is that collection of buttons. And then it says this, uh, the media block pattern is included in the following patterns in this sort of media block list. What's helpful about this is like, great, if I were to change anything about this pattern, let's say change the font size, change the alignment, change the spacing, change anything about it, add or subtract uh, certain components from it, we know exactly where we need to go and sort of re-QA and retest to make sure that, that nothing's broken, right? Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff we'll get in there. Uh, if you want to check it out, it's patternlab.io. Again, it's you know, free, open source, all that stuff. So, okay. So that's that. Well, how, do, how does this actually influence our process? <laughs> how, does this, how do we do work differently? Um, and this is probably the hardest thing, right? We could talk about different technologies, different tools until we're blue in the face, but really what it comes down to is creating uh, a, a more collaborative, a more sort of nimble process for actually sort of creating websites. Is anybody frustrated at all ever in the course of a web design development project, right? Anybody like maybe butt heads with different members of a team and stuff like that? So that's what we're going to talk about next. So talk about it through the lens of a couple different projects I've had the pleasure of working on. One is for a responsive site for Entertainment Weekly, another one for TechCrunch.com, uh, and then sort of I've talked about uh, Time Inc. a little bit as well. So I'm just going to sort of talk through how we went about 
you know, applying atomic design and good responsive design principles to our process. So set expectations. Um, does this look familiar to anybody? Web design review meeting, right? Gather around the table, all right? This is about the furthest thing away from, you know, actually interacting with a website, but yet somehow we are like, oh, let's take a look at the new homepage design. Uh, this is totally representative of how people are going to see this. Um, my uh, friend and frequent collaborator, Dan Mall, hit the nail on the head. He says, you know, as an industry, we have this tendency to sell websites like paintings. Instead, we should be selling beautiful and easy access to content agnostic of device screen size or context. And I just can't agree any more with that. Um, you know, that involves sort of redefining what design is and sort of, you know, making sure that, that our clients and colleagues are understanding of that. And in order to do this, <laughs> we have to kill this sort of old, antiquated uh, waterfall process, right? This sort of like Henry Ford style, uh, where at the beginning of the project, the uh, you know, information architect or UX designer, or whatever you want to call them, right? They go away and put their headphones on and come up with like a 200, 300 page PDF. And we put that in front of the client. And we're like, what do you think? Right? And the client's like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what we talked about. And then we, can we change this? And, and we're like, yeah, sure. And then eventually that gets passed off to the visual designers, right, who are responsible for coloring in all those sort of black rectangles. And I'm just kidding. That's like doing designers a disservice. But they're applying, thoughtfully applying color, typography, and texture to you know, these, these designs. And we put that in front of the client. And we say, what do you think? Right? And they're like, oh, man, that looks amazing. You know, that's great. Can we change this to do this? And can we move this over here? And we're like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, no problem. And we go back, and then we come back with V2, and we're like, hey, what do you think? And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind. Like, can we also do a little bit of this and that? And then we're like, yeah, sure, 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 no problem. And then we go back, and then we come back with V3, and, they're like, and we're like, hey, what do you think? And they're like, yeah, this is, this is great. That's exactly what I had in mind. Can you bring back a little bit of that V1 in there? They're like, sure, 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 no problem. Right? And so this dance happens again and again until eventually homepage underscore V17 underscore final underscore for review underscore final final underscore for dev review underscore final underscore V2 underscore final in all caps dot PSD. Right? <laughs> gets approved, and then very quietly, very slinkily, the visual designers tiptoe over to the code cave, right? Slip the designs under the door, right? And as they run away, they're like, get this done in two weeks, we're already behind schedule and budget, right? And then the coders climb out of the cave and they pick up the design, right? And they're like, ah, this is all wrong. You're all a bunch of assholes, right? Um, sound familiar to anybody, maybe? Um, so that's not good, obviously. Um, so we have to change that, right? We have to, I think, really treat uh, development, specifically front-end development, as a core part of the design process, right? So rather than this, right, we have to sort of bring everybody into the process and work in these sort of cross-disciplinary ways. Um, you know, and it's not to say that at the beginning of the project, whoever the UX designer is, is going to be sort of more, you know, cranking out more stuff versus at the end of the project. But that doesn't mean that the visual designers and front-end people I, I can't get started on their jobs uh, right away. So, all right, so once we sort of set those expectations, then we go into gather mode. Um, this is a cool tool, uh, Stylify Me. You could slap in your URL and it will spit out all of the sort of colors and font sizes and different variables that you're using in your code base. This is a great way to sort of kickstart a, a design uh, sort of style guide and pattern library. Um, another tool that I found uh, really helpful is conducting an interface inventory. What an interface inventory is, is basically rounding up all of the different sort of unique patterns that you encounter on your live site right now. Uh, this is my bank, who I hate with the heat of a thousand suns. Um, and you can sort of see why. This is just some of the buttons I've encountered uh, on their site. But this exercise, what it's meant to do is sort of round all this stuff up and sort of categorize them. So here's our buttons, here's our different form fields. 
And what this allows us to do is start having a conversation about like, okay, let's start to think about normalizing this stuff and codifying these things as patterns. This can stay, this can go, uh, this should be killed, and so on and so forth, right? So, um, so yeah, so this, this process helps document your interface, point out those inconsistencies, and really helps establish the scope of the work, right? Like if we were to redesign our site and sort of create this pattern library, this style guide, this design system to govern our, our, our site, you know, how long is that gonna take? How long is each individual component gonna take to build? And it really does lay the groundwork for that future uh, style guide and pattern library. So it helps establish that uh, sort of, um, you know, shared vocabulary and names for things. So once we get done sort of gathering, then we actually start doing some real design and development work. Um, I love sharing this story. <laughs> um, a friend of mine is a kindergarten teacher in Washington, D.C. And one day, one of her students asked, how do you make a website? And my friend was like, well, as it turns out, I have a friend that makes websites for a living. So they gave me a FaceTime call. Uh, and a six-year-old uh, girl, Ava, asked me, how do you make a website? And I said, well, it's typically a good idea to sort of sketch a picture of what you might want that website to be. And uh, an hour later, I get this picture message back. Um, and I looked at it, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And I looked at it again, and then I was like, holy shit. Like, this six-year-old girl is better than like 95% of the designers <laughs> I've ever worked with in my entire life. Clear labeling like color coding for that, you know, the X button, proper layout, freaking active state, she's, <laughs> she's six. <laughs> and here's the home page, right? It isn't crazy, right? So again, proper hierarchy, more active states, her buttons are way more consistent than my banks. Uh, like this is amazing. But what I, what I, why I love sharing this is because like I could build this right now. I think that for a long time we sort of propped up this artificial notion that it's like we have to sort of create all this like hi-fi work in order to sort of sell the ideas through, in order to articulate our ideas. And that's simply not the case. Sometimes all we need to do is just like draw a couple rectangles and say like, here's going to be a featured area, here's going to be a list of stuff, here's going to be a grid of stuff. Right? And from a visual standpoint, rather than coming out of the gate with these full comps, we can instead use uh, techniques like style tiles to present our clients with, here's just sort of a vague notion of what we're thinking as far as a couple directions go. And you can crank these things out very quickly. It's not meant to be like a give this a final approval or not. This is more meant to sort of kickstart a conversation about like what sort of what sort of color palette are we feeling? What sort of adjectives are we shooting for, right? This is a, a framework for conversation, not as like a, a, a very rigid like approve or, or, or don't approve this design. Uh, this is, we did this for the uh, TechCrunch project, a, a tool called Typecast, where you're able to put different font pairings together. And we put this in front of the client with some of their real content in place and just to just have a conversation about font pairings. And so we were looking for like, oh, I like this, I don't like this, this feels a little too cartoony, this feels a little too traditional or whatever. So it's like having those conversations in isolation uh, can be had without having to sort of create this whole big artificial unrealistic comp. And from a dev side of things, we're able to sort of go through and actually start stubbing out these patterns right away, right? Um, I, I sort of treat it as like being a, a prep chef in a restaurant, right? Front end developers can come in early and start stubbing out these patterns in markup. If I was to ask anybody in here, to any developer in here to build uh, a, a header pattern or a card pattern, you'd be able to whack away at it pretty quickly. That's all subject to change, of course, you know, as the design evolves. But what, what you can do is, is, is sort of do that work up front so that you can spend more time collaborating with the design team rather than sort of coming in after the fact, right? Sort of, you know, propping up that artificial old school waterfall process. So then from here, we sort of roll up our sleeves and actually translate these sort of, you know, our sort of really basic sort of sketchy wireframes into the browser. So this is what TechCrunch's uh, homepage looked like in Pattern Lab after maybe like the first week or two on the project. You could clearly tell this, you know, is a work in progress, but it's all in markup, it's all there, all the patterns are wired up using that greater than include sign, 
right? Stuff like that. So then from there, we're able to sort of build out the design using uh, techniques like element collages to sort of, you know, explore different uh, UI sort of variations in design treatments and sort of zone in on one given pattern and start sort of building that thing out in the browser, talking with a client the whole way, just saying like, hey, here's an idea we have for the header. Here's how we're thinking of this thing going down. And we sort of work back and forth in both static environments, like Photoshop or Sketch or whatever, but also alongside it in the browser, sort of working with the layout and stuff like that and interactivity. So we would iterate over those patterns and we'd sort of end up in these sort of weird hybrid states wherever some patterns would be done, other ones wouldn't, but that's okay because we're sort of communicating and collaborating with the whole team as well as the client over time. And it's only at this stage that we actually put sort of some full comps together. Whenever we have a solid idea of like what our aesthetic direction is, as well as what some of the, the sort of anchor sort of patterns are going to be. So by the time the client actually sees a full comp, it, this isn't coming out of nowhere. This isn't, you know, this has been sort of arrived at through the course of a lot of different discussions. So that's sort of the process, is we sort of, you know, design things and quickly build them out and iterate inside the browser. And once we are in the browser, we stay in the browser and only sort of go back out if we need to sort of spot comp something uh, there. So it's, it's about sort of working together, design, front end design, front end development. Um, uh, and sort of UI design, people working in static tools, uh, all sort of working together to get things into the browser, into that final environment much sooner, where we could test things like responsiveness, performance, true type rendering, true color rendering, right? Test on a bunch of different devices, right? So all this is to say, if people are like, oh, this sounds like Agile. It's like, eh, not, not, not really necessarily. Agile is sort of its own loaded word, um, but really, uh, what I want you to take from this is that it's, it's really just about true collaboration and communication with your team, with your clients, with your bosses, all that stuff. It trumps whatever, whatever it is you want to call your process. It also trumps whatever deliverables you create, right? So this is our reality. I love this picture. Uh, it's like a punch in the gut. This is our reality now. This is what we're building for now. Um, I love, I love this quote. I think it's so incredibly true, right? When you're finished changing, you're finished. This is especially true in a medium that's only 25 years old, right? It's like whenever you find yourself in a, in a, in a position where someone's going, well, this is how we've always done things, right? So like just remind them, right? This medium is 25 years old, right? This is breakneck speed uh, you know, we have to challenge our assumptions. We have to constantly challenge our best practices, our processes, and how we get things done. For as hard as this stuff is, I think it's a tremendous amount of fun. I don't know about you, but I played with a lot of Legos as a kid, and I don't think that this is all that much different than that. We just get paid for it, which is awesome. So um, with that, uh, if you want to check out uh, atomicdesign.bradfrost.com, uh, I'm writing a book on the subject. If you want to learn more, you can pre-order the thing for $10. It's available in its entirety for free uh, on my website. So uh, check that out. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.